Okay, thank you, Sarah and Molly. Appreciate it. Good morning. I hope all of you are getting ready for the um, holidays. And um, um, if you haven't gone to the grocery store yet, you better go today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. So it'll be interesting to see what we get. It's uh, they keep changing it. So anyways. All right. So um, today we are going to circle back on everything that we have um, been talking about um, these last few couple months. So I'll start out with um, the fact that um, we will um, um, do a little review of our presentations, come up with that list, that final list of our barriers, share with you the responses. Um, we're going to do a little activity on, um, on our barriers and work to develop um, a work plan. And I can't say this enough how important your input is. Um, it's helped us a lot even to be narrowing this down. And so today we really want you to put your brainstorming um, hat on as we talk about this to really help give us some um, additional input. So um, before we proceed, I'm gonna let Sarah do roll call. All right, everyone, this is, you know, I'm going to read the names visible in the Zoom participant list. If you don't hear your name called, you can go ahead and type it into the chat and let us know you're here. All right, so I see Craig Kissinger, Marcy Johnson, Molly Cook, Michael Massey, LaDonna Henson, Lee Reese, Brandon M. Bax, Shannon Hampton, and Eric Grebner. And I believe that's it. So again, if you don't hear your name called, you can go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll move it along. Great, thanks. So uh, we're just gonna put this, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> we're just gonna put this slide up to let you show that we are making progress. Um, you know, we have identified our barriers and um, now we're gonna start thinking about, okay, here's all of our barriers, next steps. What strategy solutions do we need to come up with? Do we need to develop tools um, to help the um, Illinois opportunity use? So as you can see, at least we're making progress, which is exciting. Um, sometimes I know we feel like we are uh, could be spinning our wheels in some meetings, but um, thank you for all for sticking with us and continuing this, uh, this journey that we have. Um, okay, next. Um, so, this is just a review of um, the presentations that we had. You know, we had Eric Grebner talk last month from Homework Hangout Club. And um, a lot of the barriers that were added um, talked about the youth criminal background. We, you know, talked about the lack of, you know, connections with adults, work experience, and, you know, that social emotional. Um, support that they need, um, just the knowledge to navigate technology. And, and then, you know, all the multifaceted issues that they have, you know, related to the, the basic needs, their education, you know, just not having financial stability, you know, not understanding that and uh, giving them um, leadership skills and um, experience with the social. So, um, I wonder if there is any questions that anybody might have still for Eric about his um, homework hangout club, if there's any, because I know Eric's on, if there's any questions that somebody might have that they're still wondering about, I'll open the floor. Or Eric, if there's anything that you want to share that maybe you've thought about from the last time you presented that you just might want to share as a summary. I'm sitting at the back of the classroom saying, please don't call on me at this point. <laughs> okay, uh, no, you're not even called you. Uh, no, 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 that, no, that's fine. Uh, no, there's not really I have to you kind of add uh, just from our presentation, just as kind of the overall, like the, the overall point is that it, it's, there's a level of complexity to the need and a level multiple levels of things that and barriers that need to be addressed uh it, it, it's it, it becomes tempting i think a lot of times when we have these discussions to kind of narrow in focus and and say uh we have come with a solution blah 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 and, and but it, at the same time 
seeing the, the all these lists and all these additions can also be overwhelming because you think, oh my God, now we have a we go from a list of twenty to a list of eighty, you know, issues here. So I think it's important to realize that it, it a lot of those overwhelming needs. You have to start somewhere, start with one, start with five, start with 10, because even though it, sometimes you will feel like, well, I, you know, I can only move the needle 5%, that five, if everybody moves the needle 5%, eventually you will have the necessary systemic change that you need, I think, to address these issues. So, you know, it, it's, it's it, having been in this field for, you know, over 25 years at this point, it, it you will sometimes it, this is not a short game this is a very long game and it's uh and that makes it difficult sometimes to realize what your successes are and sometimes you see have immediate gains sometimes it's gains 20 years down the road so that, that's just the point i want to make is that you know yes it's complex yes it's a lot but at the same time if you don't take any action then it will never change so even one action is crucial uh, if it's five actions, 10 actions, great. But even one action is crucial towards this. Thank you, Eric. And this, this is LaDonna. And I'd just like to say that I was really impressed with this homework hangout as a provider of services as well. Um, I see the total complexity um, and we work with you and it's the, the way that you've packaged it all together and, and have really well explained, like I say, how, how complex it is, and, but how important it is. And like you say, if you can move the needle a little bit, you're, you know, it's unbelievable how many people you really can help. And so um, having difficulty finding support for services that do this, um, I just really appreciate what you do. LaDonna, I echo that going into the schools and talking to kids in the Chicago South suburbs here is what I liked is the the holistic approach that um, that homework hangout talked about and you know not just you know one aspect, which it seems like a lot of organizations that are addressing one aspect. So this this is really a, a great, it, it, it educated us, but I also think it's a great success story of where uh, meaningful work is happening. Uh, now we just got to tie in an employer with it. <laughs> of how do we continue, you know, what happens when they leave uh, homework hang, hangout, uh, Eric and, and that's that's the the next step that probably we need to look into. And, and Eric, I, I will say, I would love to um, talk with you because we do that um, in our program. We we carry it on into the workplace. And so um, I would I would just love to talk with you because, uh, again, we kind of do some of the same stuff. We're in very rural Illinois, um, which presents a lot of other, you know, different problems as well. And so um if you don't mind, after the new year, maybe having a phone call or something. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't mind at all. Uh, define rule. I'm from a town of 500 originally, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're in Carbondale, and we serve everything south of Mount Vernon. So from, you know, Alexander County up, so. It's we're we're pretty cruel. <laughs> I, I've had to do I've had to do some monitoring and stuff down there before. And, yeah. You know, it's very disparate, but it also reminds it's, me very much kind of where I grew I grew up in a small town outside Bloomington, went to a high school in the middle of a cornfield. So uh okay. literally in the middle of a cornfield. So uh so yeah, I can I definitely can empathize with that. Right. But thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, LaDonna, for your uh, thoughts and feedback as well, and um, Craig. Anything else that anybody would like to share before we move on? Okay, next slide, Sarah. So this is the list, and I know it's small, 
because uh, there's a lot that we found that are barriers for opportunity youth. Um, just take a look at this. I won't read them all to you, but you know, just think about all the things that we have talked about. And uh, in your thought, your input has been great for this. And then in a minute, we're going to show you um, the uh, top five in the numbers um, that we have um, on how you um, how you scored uh, these barriers. Um, so again, you know, we've talked about the fact that we really need to narrow it down in order to, um, as Eric said, you know, start small. What, what can we tackle first and where we think the most important thing is. So Sarah, you wanna to go to the next slide? So here's the survey responses. And as you can see, I mean, we felt like a lot of these are still very, very important. Um, and um, not to say that, you know, what the smallest one is parameters around GED qualifications. Sometimes there are some things beyond our control right and we know that that's an important barrier we don't know if that's something that we can do but we also know that there are other pieces that are just as important did anything on this list surprise anybody on the scores or um or what's on the list well, i think you know the takeaway that i took marcy is how in some of these how it's it's almost a waterfall effect in some cases either some of them you could combine right we mm -hmm. we say similar things different ways yeah. when i think about uh basic you know we talk about hey they have basic needs but they also have lack of parent engagement <laughs> right. i mean that that goes hand in hand mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. is yeah. how do we uplift the parent so that we can uplift the children Right. Yeah, right. Um, but, you know, when you look at the scope of this and, and I kind of we were going back and forth email going, well, this is an exhaust. I mean, it's, it's a huge list. It's almost mm -hmm. overwhelming yeah. is. Some of them go together, but also how many of these things impact one another? Right. Is that it's that waterfall effect that if you don't have some of those basic needs, Maslow hierarchy of needs. If you don't have food, shelter, emotional mm -hmm. support, yeah, all this other stuff goes goes to crap for for kids, right? right. Particularly <clears throat> when they're in such in a, a a fragile state, you know, at that time of adolescence, right? Mm -hmm. It's so mm -hmm. foundational. So. Um, so th that's what I took away from looking at the big list, but then even looking at this, trying to think about how, how do we pare it down? Thanks. Anybody else have thoughts just looking at this? Any surprises? Okay, Sarah, let's go to the next slide. So here's the top five. Uh, the biggest one was transportation. Um, you know, ironically, we've gotten some calls lately on, you know, is transportation required if they're in work-based learning? Or, you know, how are they supposed to get to school or to their job? You know, so I think schools are also seeing this as a barrier. Uh, to offer work-based learning um, for students. So I think they're seeing it from both sides. I mean, Craig talked about the uh, lack of basic needs. Um, you know, that's that's a tough one. Um, there's a lot, you know, people are really hurting. And um, like you said, the basic needs are the important piece and everything else goes to the side. And I think if we can help them to understand that, you know, getting a job and, um, um, you know, get bringing in that income can help with those basic needs, but it's like, you know, helping with that, the social emotional. Um, the next one was lack of parent involvement or lack of permanent connections to responsible adults. Um, you know, when, when the students get into high school, parents sometimes do hands off. They don't know what's going on. 
um, with their um, child and, you know, and then when they move on to getting a job and they were living at home, but they, the parents are like, okay, you're, you're out of high school, you know, so it's, it, we have to figure out a way to get information to parents. Um, on the same respect, uh, those of you that are in manufacturing, you know, it used to be that manufacturing was a dirty job. And parents, that was the last thing a parent want was their child to go into a manufacturing program. And it's making parents aware of how, you know, it's not like that anymore. And, um, you know, learn, having them learn about all the different careers and that it's not necessarily that they have to go to college to have a really good paying job. Um, and so it is an awareness, not just for, for the students, but it's also awareness for parents. Um, and then, of course, you know, that lack of awareness, I think, is overall. Um, and then the lack of support for education and credentials. Um, uh, it's hard to have industry recognized credentials in the high schools. Um, it's a little bit easier in the community colleges. Uh, we have to make sure that the educators who are teaching the students have those credentials. How do we support the educators? Um, to offer those credentials so that students do have those. Um, we've talked about the fact that, you know, how important are credentials in the business and, and industry area, and how can we promote um, that information to show that, you know, business and industry really does want um, employees with um, credentials. That's just my takeaway on that. I don't know what everybody else has thought, Craig. Um, anybody else wanna talk about these barriers? Anything else that maybe you think I'm not thinking about? So before I jump in, I just wanted to see if others. <laughs> Wait time. Oh, 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 only because Again, because being a business and going into schools, I see a lot of this stuff. Uh -huh. And and that's what it, hopefully I, I, as I try to lead, I, I bring to these groups is that business perspective with students is I think it's important as we look at each of these to make sure we understand not only what it is, but to your point, I long term to employment as that is a foundation of long-term success, right? And sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, so using the example of education and credentials is understanding what are the universal right credentials? What, what does that education look like? And versus a credential just for the sake of, of a credential, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, I've talked to local schools about NIMS, and I said, you know, I, I think that's great that you're doing NIMS. How many actually understand what it is? How many manufacturers versus, as I talk about, NCC, ER, and that's a credential that can get you, it can get you into manufacturing, and they probably don't know what it is, but every refinery or nuclear facility. Yeah will recognize that and it's foundational and it's stackable, right? right. Um, I recently talked to a student, uh, a local school who was excited to share with me, he had his OSHA 10 card. And I said, that is awesome. So tell me a little bit about the, the general duty clause. What is that? How does that protect workers? The what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's it's making sure that if they have that credential, that's why it's important tying it to job related yep. so that they, you know, if we just teach them the book stuff and not the application, it, right. it's it, it's not, you, you know better than any, a lot of people on here know, that's where the real learning happens, right? That's why uh, apprenticeships, or on the job training, or what I would love to see, OJT on steroids, right? A combination where it's, it doesn't have to be the full apprenticeship because not mm -hmm. everything fits that model. Mm -hmm. 
but OJT is only three to six months. We maybe we need something a year and you know, them learning our train system or manufacturing process, right? Um, but tying that to hands-on, I think is important for these students. And I think it drives engagement and, and helps with a lot of these other things. Yeah. The other thing I'll say, and I, and I, I said it already, and I think you mentioned it, educating the parents. I think the rising tide raises all boats. And I think if we uh, identify ways to address some of this stuff systemically with their parents, their grandparents, who's ever, who's ever raising them, whoever has guardianship will help them in the long term, right? So I think we've got to think inclusive and multi-channel so that we can address the student and whatever their support structure does or doesn't look like. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? I'd like to give your thoughts. Nina, Jasmine, any experience? Let's say, and Lee, you know, in the work that you're doing, have you, do you see these as being, um, um, some of the top barriers, or are we missing the boat here? Maybe these really aren't the top barriers um, for those. Well, of these were no surprise, but um, I do see employers going the reverse on the credentials um, with the apprenticeships. They're picking out of certificates and associates degrees only the things necessary for them to to be able to demonstrate proficiencies. These for for me, these are completely consistent with what we've seen and we're having, um, as we prepare to get ready to um, RFP, our next round of youth agencies internally, we're talking about like, what are the top barriers? What are some of the things that we need that need to be like top of mind as we get ready to plan? Um, and this is, this is just spot on. I'm sitting here feeling a little bit sad um, about it because we're not in control. Um, of all of these things. But one of the things we just recently met about was kind of some educational trauma that some young people have when they haven't done particularly well in high school or perhaps they've dropped out and gotten a GED. And then they come to us and we're like, training, training, you could get, you don't have to go to college, but here are these programs. But still um, for us, there are minimum education requirements that you kind of need to test at. Um, for those various fields and they kind of come down from the industry so like you know for CNA you need to be you're reading and math they need to be at an eighth grade level um, or for some of those IT um, for some of those IT programs they're wanting to see you know 11th grade in reading and math and um, some young people can't test there so then you're looking at trying to do skill building until they can get there and by the time that happens they're just like ready to work anywhere um, and also the basic needs, um, 18 to 24 is a hot age for being like put out of the house um, mm -hmm. because legally your parents don't have to, um, right. they don't have to take it. And then there's you too, like the teenager, you know, feeling grown, if you will, maybe not even fully understanding what it means to be like an adult. Um, so, I mean, it was very, it's, you know, it's common for a lot of young people to like go through a, a time of experiencing homelessness. Um, even though it may not look like someone who's been on the street for 30 years, but if you're like, oh, you know, I have to get out and go sleep on my auntie's couch and she lives on the other side of town and, um, and then it ties right in, you know, to the next thing. Um, so these are, um, these are spot on from, from what we can tell in our system and transportation is always huge, um, you know, just because of the the, I don't want to call them business deserts, but we know that there's just not, for us in Chicago, we have our South and West sides, which are our lower income areas, um, more populated with people of color. Um, and there are just not as many businesses there, right? Not as many of your larger businesses or just businesses, you know, period, that really lead to career path. Perhaps mm -hmm. there's restaurants and stores that you could work at, but not on, nothing on a large scale. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about you guys are talking about um, manufacturing, 
um, for us, it, it's a great career pathway, but young people need transportation. They really need a car to get to a lot of where those larger uh, manufacturing opportunities are because naturally they need more land. So then they, they set up shop in places um, where land is a little bit more affordable, which is typically outside of the city limits. So um, these, these are spot on for us and we're working on um, creative ways to address it. Um, working on getting more resources out to our people because we're finding out that our front line is not necessarily equipped to like provide the referrals that they um, need to um, because they don't know, right? They don't have a list of like all the homeless, you know, all the homeless places that people who are experiencing homelessness can go, shelters, mm -hmm. school giveaways, um, that sort of thing. Um, and the, the education, that that is a fight because people you know, again, when you have that trauma, it's just like if anyone here is not good in math, they know about educational trauma, right? As soon as you see it, it scares you. So um, it's it's spot on. It's spot on based on our experience, and and we're hoping to, um, you know, do better about making connections to nonprofits um, and other agencies because it's difficult for us to kind of take all of that on, right? Um, and the only thing that I'm not well, it, it was on the larger list, but just the mental health, we're seeing a lot more young people um, dealing with mental health and mm -hmm. not really, we're not really sure if that needs to be addressed, you know, before they start employment, it's kind of difficult to, to ascertain if it should be addressed before we seek employment or do we like try to get you, you know, something now, but then be working on that in the background, like many of us are, right? I can tell you from what I see, Jasmine, you're you're right. And I think that mental health ties into that basic needs. Again, every time I think about that is that's Maslow hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. and that that uh, that safety, security, you know, we think about mm -hmm. home, but that's also emotional and mental security. And I think doing that coupled with the job builds up self-esteem, confidence, and I think you, you, to your point, you really need to couple those together uh, to show a win and to show what success looks like and feels like when you achieve it yourself to, in order to teach them and build resilience and sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. Versus somebody always having to do it for them, right? Mm -hmm. So true. Eric, did you see Mike's question? Mike asked a question because you guys do a lot of this stuff in your program, Eric. Do you see yeah, how? It, yeah, and I was attempting to do a, a, a very long answer in the chat. Uh, I think I'll we'll just stop that because my typing skills are failing me at the moment. Um, now, uh, the, it's the too small to needs, see and spell everything right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the basic needs thing, yeah, that's informing everything. Uh, you can't sit and focus on a training if you're hungry or if you're unclear where you're going to be staying that night or last yeah. night you just you and your friends just ran two miles through back alleys trying to zigzag around to avoid getting shot by some guy who's out trying to get you guys mm -hmm. and, and from there your, your expectation is okay well next day you, you're supposed to sit in class and focus and everything else but what jasmine points out is is actually i think one of the main problems is that the the groups that you know the, the, our groups that were the ones who are working directly with participants a lot of times uh, almost have to be the ones that provide the services that are needed to kind of address a lot of these basic needs because what happens is is that you know we're because of our you know lack of our resources we're kind of forced to you know we're going to refer them here or we're going to send them here to do x well then you're creating another series of problems which is that yes we're we're doing all we can do to provide for these needs but if we have to send them out then we're not 100 percent sure that that is complicating the problem uh you know your other need on here your largest one is transportation if I'm referring someone to, you know, go to a food shelter, go to housing, go to get this, they got to get there. And they got to get there within the time frames that are allowed, which are often, you know, limited and subject to limits, subject to this. 
but at the same time, then it kind of falls back on us as direct providers to try to do as much as we possibly can in house. I mean, we have the blessing of having a, a very large facility with a full kitchen with everything else. So we can host, we can do a lot of food preparation and a lot of direct services here. But at the same time, how much of that is available to us? Food, for example, is almost an unallowable expenditure in just about any program. There's maybe one or two programs that are SNAP based uh, in the source funding to allow for that those expenditures for food. Uh, but a lot of programs don't have access to that. If you're a WIOA funded program, you don't, you're not allowed to spend for food or food prep or anything else. Yet this is probably one of the simplest ways of a program, that, especially if they have the ability to prepare or purchase, can provide direct services. They're hungry, they're coming in, they get them fed in the morning. Our participants, they eat breakfast every morning, they eat lunch. Uh, if they're here in the afternoon, they walk, they either eat or walk home with dinner, leaving the program at 6 p.m. each day. Uh, but we have other resources that can provide the food. That's a very simple thing. But it's providing just one of those needs. So the biggest thing is that direct service providers need to have or, or allowed to be have a lot more flexibility for the basic needs uh, beyond to be able to provide it directly as opposed to being kind of forced to have to refer out uh, to be, so that you're not running into other barriers trying to get these services away from your organization. Uh, I will tell you a big one with regarding this transportation. Yeah, it's easy to, you know, get bus passes, get other sources of transportation to fund that directly. You're running into a lot of kids though, is this is a short-term solution. Why aren't they able to drive? Why aren't they getting a license? Well, for one thing, they don't have access to driver's education. Mm -hmm. If they drop out of school at 13, 14, they're not getting the free driver's ed through school. Right. They have, if they're lucky, they may have a school that can provide driving instruction at a cost. And you say, well, the providers can provide the support, provide the cost, but then you have to get into the driver's instruction. And you have to rely on the fact that you may not have driver's education in your community. I, I'm in Decatur. This is a community of around 70,000 people, we do not have driver's education independent of the schools. Uh, their CDL education uh, at the community college, but we don't have driver's ed. So a lot of times is, you know, we're waiting for participants to turn 18. We've actually gone out and driven with some participants to help them try to acquire the license. The closest driving school is Clinton, Illinois. That's 20 miles away. How am I gonna be able to get participants there to learn how to get a license? Right. Then on top of that, sure, they get their license. Do what's their credit like? Has it been ruined by parents trying to use a social security number to do this? Can they acquire a vehicle? Can they afford the insurance? You the know, especially tickets that you'll get in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I bet in Chicago's, you know, got even worse problems because you're in a community where you're you have literal, you know, walls, highways that have subdivided that community and make it impossible to access other areas. Uh, so it all informs on one thing or another, and it, it's not, like I said, there's no easy solutions, and we need to look into ways where, yes, we can provide assist, direct, immediate assistance, but also we need to get the long-term solutions. Mm -hmm. Where are, where, how can we fund driver's ed for high school dropouts who don't have access to these programs and who did not get that while they're in school? Uh, because I think that addresses a potential long-term issue with the transportation. It's just these kids are out there with no license. And then, of course, what happens, they're driving anyway. Uh, <laughs> they're driving anyway. Then they get pulled over. Now they're getting, you know, charges that are going to prevent them from being able to hold a license in the future because they drove without a license, without insurance, without everything else. So it's, it, it's, it's no simple solution, but it all kind of goes back just that basic needs and getting more types of training, types of funding that allow us to expend more to help with basic needs and to address more of the long-term solutions versus the short-term assistance. Great points, Eric, thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Nina. One thing I wanna comment on too, that what we're seeing 
in the private business and vocational school space is our more successful schools at placement and getting you know placement into jobs and getting people to actually complete programs are more fruitful on-site student services or wraparound services. I know Eric mentioned, um, you know, trouble kind of farming students out or making referrals elsewhere, but we're finding, you know, if the schools have student services and are, are able to make referrals to the local area, then um, those students kind of feel like the school's invested in them and, and you know, do their best to try to participate and, and complete and succeed. So um, while it's not in our statute and rules that student services are required, um, we're at the board um, discussing how we can incorporate um, some of that into our application questions, you know, like what student services are you providing or looking into, why or why not, um, especially, you know, when they, we ask them to declare a target population that they're providing instruction to, and, and you know, if you're targeting a certain population, they obviously have barriers and needs, and so why, why aren't you addressing them if you're targeting that specific population? Just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Appreciate that, Nina. Anybody else? So my great question um, about what are we doing to address the barriers? So um, <laughs> one of the things that we've been working on with the credentials is trying to develop a list so that districts are more, are more aware of the credentials that um, businesses are, um, are feel are important, that are of value. Um, and that one of those things, once we have this list together, which is really close, we wanna share it with the business community and get thoughts on what did we miss, if we're really off track, you know, um, things like that. Um, Career awareness, that's something that we're always um, trying to work on, um, both from all grades. We give uh, funds to um, our regions for career exploration, uh, career awareness. Um, so hopefully they have some funding. It's not much, but it's a little bit to help with that. Um, so they can bring in guest speakers or, you know, um, do focus their day on a certain air, a certain career. We've developed, as Mike knows, the the career guides um, that we had hope hope that one it would do a career awareness, make them aware of all the different a, a lot of not all a lot of the different um, um, jobs that are occupations that are in each area that and then what the salary would be and what the um, um, what the education would be required. So we even start at high school all the way up to a bachelor's um, just for them to understand, you know, if, if this is what you want to do, here's what your goal would be. Um, and at the same time, we were hoping that it would also get to the parents um, so that parents understood, you know, well, they don't have to go to college and they make that, they can make that kind of money. So it, it was, it was a twofold um, piece. Um, schools can use that as a, a, you know, a curriculum to, or, a tool um, for their career awareness as well. Um, transportation, it can be used for students that are special populations. Um, funds can be used with the Perkins funding for transportation um, to help with that. Um, and we don't do, we ourselves in CTE don't do much on basic needs. However, we have a wellness department that really focuses on uh, you know, uh, social, emotional, and, um, you know, resources out there, um, as well as a student cares department that helps to support um, the parents and, and any needs um, that there may be. So even though it's not in CTE, there are um, other avenues within ISBE um, that we work on. And um, uh, LaDonna, I will, the um, career guides are digital. And I will share a link with you for those, and I'll put it in the chat uh, for those career guides so that you can all see it. So then the next steps. Yes. So next slide. So 
So, you know, the, so we've talked a little bit about this. How are we going to address these barriers? What are we doing right now? Um, we, we know from, you know, various things. I, I also saw where um, uh, Shannon put in about the PACE framework, the post-secondary and career expectation framework, what each student needs to have, know and understand um, as they move along in high school. Um, knowing where some of the funding comes from when we talk about the, the local uh, workforce boards or um, how we get to stakeholders. Um, you know, there's a variety of different um, areas that we've talked about and some of these are examples of, of things that we've done. Um, so as we create our work plan, we wanna think about what those solutions might be, get your thoughts, your input. Um, on that. Is there anything else, um, Craig, you want to add to this slide? No, no, I think this is this good as far as to capture some of those ideas, but I think we want to really get to that brainstorming yep. session because, yep. you know, I think it's important to understand when, when we talk about a work plan, um, what Marcy and I have signed the group up for. Thank you, everybody, for uh, being voluntold that we're going to do this <laughs> is um, through the process that we we follow with the uh, with career pathways for target populations. Uh, each of those targeted populations is taking a quarter meeting, right, uh, to highlight success stories between uh, our particular group and um, maybe a school and community, right? So how, how are we highlighting, you know, homework hangout and how does that tie to success when they leave, you know, homework hangout program, right? And, and you know, how, what that work looks like. So that's what we wanna do on a quarterly basis. But I think what I hear is the other part of our work plan is is there policy work? Is there a Wednesday webinar that we want to put on? Is there something with regional superintendents that we need to have a discussion? All those different things is work beyond um, maybe our quarterly meeting that we could choose. You know, in when we do our normal monthly meeting in April, we're going to have that with this group of people and have an open discussion as kind of the, hopefully the state SMEs on this topic, as we've gathered people across the state to give them feedback on where we need help, right? Is that kind of just to set the framework for what, what yep. we're asking people for ideas on? Yeah, so let's go to that slide, to those next slides. So when we talk about we want to talk about long-term goals, short-term goals, some solutions, and when to address it. And um, we're looking; these are the five barriers. And so I, we've, I've asked Sarah and um, and Molly to help us create. Um, it's like a jam board. It's a way for us to um, just just document um, everybody's thoughts. And so Sarah, you want to show them how this works and then we'll give everybody about five minutes just to do some brainstorming on some of these. Yep. All right. So, um, this has been great discussion and we're excited to see how we can incorporate that into our work plan. So Molly has put the link to this jam board into the chat. Um, and if you want to click on that link, it should lead you to this screen. Um, on the first screen, you see the barriers on the left-hand side, and then another column that's what are our short-term goals for these barriers. And in order to, we're asking you to put your input in for the short-term goals, you go over here to the left, you click on this little sticky note, and then you say, you know, policy guidance. And then you click it, and you can put it wherever you want, click and drag. I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And then up at the top, there is this little arrow to the right, and you click that, and then it'll go into the long term barriers, which you feel like we should do with the barriers that, or the long term goals of what we should do with the barriers. And then the third slide are possible solutions. So we're trying to kind of 
tie our goals to solutions that we could produce or find or market. Um, I guess my first question is, can everyone access this board? So it looks like, just so everybody knows, on the right-hand side, there's something that says mode, and like mine says view only. You may need to click uh, request access, or maybe you can open it up for everybody, Molly. Yeah, I can I can uh, change it to editor mode. Yeah. Just um, It should be okay now, but I'll put a link in the chat again in case it's still view for you. And this this link should be fine, but the one that you had at first should also be fine now to edit. It's working now. Good. Yes, and so what I thought is we could maybe take about five minutes. People can brainstorm on any of these pages, but it won't be closed. So if you feel like you want to go back later and add more to this, you can. Um, and then maybe we can just, um, you know, give you all a little time later that we can go back then and you know, look at everything that we've received. Would that sound good for everybody? Because I know sometimes you have to sit and think about it. And I mean, there's a lot here. Um, so we might, we wouldn't get through everything, but I just wanted to give everybody just five minutes just to think about some some things that, that are burning in their mind at the moment, as I would say, so. And, and the link won't just be in the chat. We'll include those in the minutes and notes when we send them out. So yep. you can can get back to it once we close the Zoom session. Absolutely. So let's just have five minutes and you guys can just start throwing it out. If anybody has problems, put it in the chat. Molly and Sarah can help you with this. Um, I think it's pretty intuitive, but if you have troubles, just let us know, okay? And I'm just going to pop on, I see someone trying to write, and that's a noble goal, but if you want a sticky note so you can type, it's over here on the left, it looks like a little square with some lines, and you click that, and then you'll be able to type your message. I just saw you click on the thing for the to be able to put the sticky with that particular one. Yes. So then once you post it, then you can just click and drag. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you.
looking great. We got um, what, one more minute, Sarah? Yep. Okay. And I would say, you know, whether we think these are short term or long term, I think that's some of what Molly, Molly yeah. and and Marcy and I, we, we and Sarah and I, we we can all do maybe yeah. separate if we just let's get let's get the thought. And I started thinking about, yeah. <laughs> hey, you, we need people to do a brain dump, and yeah. then we can see maybe help with what's long term versus short term, and then bring it back to the group and like we did with the barrier, see if they yeah. agree. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yep. this could be one of these case, real easy to say and type right <laughs> how the yeah. heck do we do it well that that's that's why we have such great people participating yep. that's right help yep. us figure out how to do it i just love that everybody's contributing here this is really helpful And we know we have a larger group than this, Sarah. I think when we send out the notes, we know there was a couple people that weren't able to participate. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe somehow send a snapshot in the email some of the work that we did, rather than ha making them go to the link. Maybe just take a, you know, make a pic so they can see it, so that they're encouraged. Hey, I want to get involved yeah. in this process, right? I'm, I'm thinking yeah. with my yeah. business marketing. Right. How do you how do you drive that engagement. Oh, it's another half page email yeah, right. <laughs> with links. Yeah. They they never see the exciting stuff because they have to follow the, the link. Maybe, maybe we might just have to change up how we address our group. Yeah. I don't know. Just so Sarah, just you thinking. want to put this slide back up the slides? <clears throat> yep. Let me minimize this. Team, this this is amazing. I love this. Thank you. All right. So we were here and I'll go ahead and go to the next steps, Marcy, if you yeah. want. Okay. Yep. So our next meeting is uh, January 25th. And um hoping that everybody can join us for that meeting. Um, we will have more information coming at that meeting about the um, meeting that we will be doing with the bigger group, the CPTP um, a bigger group uh, to share with them information. And the next steps too are going to be us looking at uh, this Jamboard. So please continue to add information to it. Hang on to that link. Um, and we will be looking at it and trying to rearrange and see, like Craig said, what what is long term, short term, or you know what we can accomplish, and provide some thoughts on that. So, <clears throat> yes, Sarah, it is at nine thirty, right, on the twenty fifth. Yes, it'll be the same and, time, nine thirty to ten thirty. And I was gonna. The only other ask that I was to say because this is great for goals, and when we think <laughs> about this, and maybe some of this stuff ties into solutions. But you guys have done such an awesome job in populating that. I, we really need to also think, okay, what are the solutions that maybe we can highlight? Are there other states that are doing a really good job with this that I I don't know if we do a good job of reaching out to other states <laughs> to say, hey, how are you doing this? Let's mm -hmm. not reinvent the wheel, right? Yep. Let, right. Let's be creative and and how we can come up with best practices or or solutions to these yep. and and maybe challenge ourselves to to do it like somebody else is doing absolutely okay um is that the last slide sarah <clears throat> yep thank you so um we want to thank everybody for their time today uh this we thought this might be a better way for everybody to provide their thoughts and input instead of us trying to just ask and Sarah taking notes. 
And so we would like to know from you if you like this type of platform to gather your information. Uh, this is the first time we've done that with this group, but I know if, if you're like me, you're in a lot of meetings and people are doing this all the time anymore. But um, I just we just really appreciate everyone being here today. Uh, we wish you a happy holidays and time with your family. Stay safe during this uh, crazy weather that we're going to be getting. And um, please let us know if there's anything um, anything else that you're thinking of after you get off the call, just send Sarah and us um, an email. So again, thank you very much for joining. And I know, Craig, if there's anything you wanna add before we close? No, no, I think you've said it all. Just be safe, be healthy and, and enjoy time with family. And uh, we appreciate everybody's efforts and look forward to continuing efforts in the new year. Yep. So thank you very much. And we'll see you in January. See you next year. <laughs> yep. Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.